I add my voice to that of those who have spoken and thank you all for welcoming us. And Happy New Year. Turn to your neighbor on my behalf and say, Happy New Year. Yes, uh, we praise God and thank him for helping us to go through the year 2019 and to cross over to the new year 2020. I want to say this is a year of great opportunities, so we need to thank God because we are blessed to be at the very beginning of yet another year 2020. The Vice Chancellor, Reverend Canon Dr. John Senyonyi, and your dear wife, Canon Dr. Ruth Senyonyi. I'm very happy to see you. And again, I congratulate Canon Dr. Ruth Senyonyi upon your installation as Canon of All Saints Cathedral, Kampala. <clears throat> uh, we now have two Canons in one house. They know how to. Yeah, that's good. And uh, I want to. Uh, thank uh, Reverend, I mean Canon Dr. Ruth Senyonyi, uh, who works as the Provincial Mothers Union President. Uh, she has kept the Mothers Union together and Canon Ruth, you are a blessing to Mothers Union and the Church of Uganda. Thank you Canon for supporting uh, the President of Mothers Union because she moves all over the country. She has been to Karamoja, she goes all over the place. Why don't you appreciate the Mother's Union President? <laughs> Your Excellency, you have supported me, and I think I have supported you equally, so we want to praise God for our ministry together, and for us, clergy, when you want anything done, you beep Mother's Union. Everything will be done. Praise the Lord. Uh, the DVCs, I want to thank God for you. And among the DVCs, we have a reverend, a deacon, a reverend uh, Dr. John Kitaimba. And again, in one family, there are two reverends. That's another, another blessing. Heads of departments, uh, the head of late and um, Christians of this chapel, my brother, Bishop Joel, and Mama Joy Obetia. Mama Joy Obetia is here. Uh, she is a priest in our Diocese of Kampala, uh, so we want to thank God for you. And uh, Equity Bank, uh, uh, Mr. Samuel Kazoba, thank you for being our ambassador in Equity Bank. Let me say more about Equity Bank. For many years, we had struggled to construct church house. And then when we entered into this partnership with Equity Bank, things became easy. It is the only bank, I have said this without any apology, that uh, stood with us, so there is no other bank that would ever stand with us in those bad and good times. They gave us money, not free, we are paying the loan, but they gave us over 70% uh, loan to uh, build church house and finish it. And now opposite Bank of Uganda on Kampala Road stands a 16 storied church house building. And they were based in Katwe as their headquarters when we uh, launched Church House and opened it, they moved their headquarters to Church House and they have uh, Equity Bank Church House branch. And they are our anchor tenants in that Church House. And they are being convinced to take more floors because we want to thank God. So may God bless Equity Bank because we are development partners and because of that, a church, a chapel like this one, a university, if you have accounts with Equity Bank, an individual, a, an archdeacon or a diocese, you go in and you get loans according to your desire. No bank can ever do that in this country. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, I want to introduce my team. We have our diocesan secretary, the Reverend Canon Dr. No, Reverend Canon John Awodi. He will be a doctor later. <laughs> yeah. Reverend Samuel Kanyike, uh, my chaplain. And Samuel doubles as the Dyson Youth Worker Kampala Diocese. And of course, he's the husband of the assistant chaplain here, uh, Reverend Rovinsa. I have on my team Mr. Sadiq Adams. Uh, Sadiq Adams, he has nothing to do with Islam. Uh, his parents love the names. He's our communications officer. Uh, he's here. Uh, this young man is very active. Yes, 
Uh, we want to welcome again, he has already been welcomed, our first vice chancellor, a friend of the Church of Uganda and friend of the university, Professor Stephen Knoll. We want to welcome you and to thank you. Even when he retired, UCU is still at his heart. Many times he comes to visit, he writes letters to us of encouragement, and when he has a dream, he tells us, I always receive your messages, Professor, with joy and knowing that you uh, started the seed. You know, 22 years ago, the provincial assembly, which is the parliament of the church, took a risk and resolved to make Bishop Taka College a university, UCU. And we thank God uh, that risk has, be, has given us great strides, and UCU is a great joy and pride for the Church of Uganda. So on behalf of the whole Church of Uganda, I want to thank our brother and friend, Professor Noll, who accepted to be the founding vice chancellor, and he worked with two chancellors, and uh, uh, I'm the third chancellor, and we are waiting for the new chancellor when I retire, as I will say a little more about it. So we thank God for the development of the university. And now we have two constituent colleges, Bishop Barham University College Kabale and Mbale University College. And we have uh, a training hospital, UCU School of Medicine at Meng Hospital, the oldest hospital in this country. Praise the Lord. Again, I welcome, the, uh, welcome our two chaplains, the chaplain and his assistant. Thank you for coming. I want to tell you that this is there for the children. 2019 was there for the children because we discovered as a church that the children are being neglected. They are at risk. Some are being sacrificed and we are not speaking as a church. So we decided to focus. The provincial assembly, uh, the 24th provincial assembly decided to make their 2019 there for the children to focus on advocating for their rights loving them as God loves them because they are a gift from the Lord and also giving them a good foundation that when you give children a good foundation, access to good medical care and education, you know they are the future leaders. And we have decided the Provincial Assembly Standing Committee saw the need, so we have again continued with, continued with that. So this year, 2020, will it be the year for the children. And I want to thank the university I've just been to the children's church. I almost forgot to come here. Uh, they are wonderful people. Thank you, parents, for preparing the children because the church makes it clear that we need to give the children the opportunity to worship God as they are young and grow knowing and loving God. Although you already know, I have the pleasure to announce that on the 28th of August, 2019, in Huntington Chapel, in St. Paul's Cathedral, Namirembe, the House of Bishops elected the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Kazimba Mugalu to be the ninth Archbishop of Uganda. And therefore I can say I am the happiest man in the world. Ask me why? I have a successor. Yes, I have a successor. And uh, that, ha that was a blessing. We didn't have politics. You know the church can also have politics. Especially in my case, I said, because I have learned from bishops and others who want to say you'll succeed me. Is it your family business? You can do that in your family. So I told you, I didn't have a candidate. God had the anointed man of his choice. And on that day, we saw the hand of the Lord. And there was no conflict. We were so happy. And the church is happy. Because we have a godly man who happens to be my dear brother in Christ. So fellowship will continue. Praise the Lord. The enthronement has been, the enthronement for our ninth archbishop has been planned to be on the 1st of March 2020 at St. Paul's Cathedral, Namirembe, which is the provincial cathedral. Did you know that? Uh, Namirembe Cathedral is the provincial cathedral. That is where the archbishop's cathedral is on national and provincial functions. We do it at St. Paul's Cathedral, Namirembe. So 1st March is the day. And let me tell you, that is the day I'll be celebrating my 65th birthday. It will be on that very day. And uh, I'll be happily handing over to my brother, my successor. And then as per the constitution of the Church of Uganda, a week later, I'll be handing over to him the Diocese of Kampala as the 8th Bishop of Kampala uh, on 8th March. And the farewell 
an enthronement organizing committee for the province is chaired by Honorable Ruth Nankabirwa and deputized by Honorable General Edward Katumba Amala, and they are working very hard. And the Dyson Organizing Committee for the Farewell and Enthronement is chaired by retired Lieutenant Colonel Robert, Colonel Robert Sekide, is our chairman for the diocese. Praise the Lord. Yes, I'm saying farewell to you. I'm saying quaheri to you. What is happening? Let me make it clear. I'm not only retiring from being the eighth Archbishop of Uganda, but I'm retiring from the long service of over 43 years of full-time church ministry non-stop. Yes, I started as a catechist in 1975. Many of you were not born. And then 1977, I went to be a missionary in Karamoja just a week after uh, our archbishop, third archbishop, had been killed. And then I went to Moroto. I was there. Then I came to train here as an ordinand in 1979, and I was here as a student from Karamoja. When I graduated in 1981, I went back to my missionary area, and I was ordained on the 6th of December, 1981. My contemporaries are Dr. Bishop Dr. Joel Obetia. We were together, and we again met in Oxford when he was doing his PhD. I was doing my master's degree. Uh, he's now a dear friend and retired. Among our contemporaries, it's only one bishop who is still uh, in office, Bishop George Bagam Honda. You know, he was younger than us. He's the only one, our group, those who became bishops, uh, they are, he's the only one uh, still in service, and I think he has a few years. So we want to thank God. So <laughs> we want to thank God for the blessing he has bestowed upon us. So coming to UCU is coming home, is coming home because... I have been here as your bishop, your chancellor, and your friend, your pastor. And uh, with the vice chancellor, we agreed that I should be doing pastoral visits at least every semester. I used to come here to be closer to you. I didn't want to remain a ceremonial chancellor who comes only to preside over graduation, but also to be uh, part of you, meet the guild government, although sometimes they asked me management questions and I would say with intelligence that this is a management question I would refer to the right people praise the Lord so your excellency the guild president I congratulate you and thank God for you and we pray that uh, you will continue to serve the Lord in your respective capacities so I am retiring after those many years and I am happy and you know retirement begins in the mind I am already, I'm only waiting for the day because I have been at it for a long time. I've been in many places. I've told you, Karamoja, then I was a vicar of a cathedral in Hoima. I was an archdeacon. Then when I came back from Oxford, I was a Dyson secretary. Once upon a time, I was the provincial secretary. When Professor Noll was active, we were working, working together. And then I went to be the first bishop of Masindi Kitara Diocese. And by God's grace, I'm where I am. Praise the Lord. So my message to you has the theme, God's grace has led us this far. God's grace has led us this far. So I'm retiring from office work, but not from preaching the gospel. For us clergy, we retire from preaching the gospel when God calls you home. So I'll continue to preach the gospel uh, of the kingdom of God by God's grace. I love the words of King David in our Old Testament reading, First Chronicles, Chapter 17 and verse 16 and 17. First Chronicles, chapter 17 and verse 16 and 17. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought us this far? And this was a small thing in your eyes, O God. You have also spoken of your servant's house for a great while to come. And have shown me future generations, O oh Lord God. Who is King David? He was one of the sons of Jesse. And when God uh, directed and instructed Prophet Samuel to go to the family of Jesse and anoint one of his sons, King of Israel, you can read the story in First Samuel chapter 16. Samuel obeyed God and went uh, to the house of Jesse. And the first son to come was a great man, a giant. And uh, Samuel was convinced. He almost stood up and anointed him. But the spirit said, God has rejected him. 
You look at the outside, but God looks at the heart. Praise the Lord. God looks at the heart. And as you listen to me, as I say farewell to you, the Lord is looking at your heart. He knows what you are thinking. Hallelujah. He knows your emotions. He knows what you are planning to do. So the first son of Jesse was rejected. The second one came rejected. The third one rejected. And when, when all were finished, Samuel said, don't you have other sons? Are they all that you have? Then Jesse remembered there was a shepherd boy, David, in the field looking after the sheep. He said, you call him here. We cannot sit down unless he comes. And when David came from the field, the Bible tells us he was a handsome man. And the spirit of the Lord said to Samuel, stand up and anoint him. He is the man. Hallelujah. You know, God calls us in his own way. You are all called from different places. So David was anointed as king of Israel, and he was he's one of the greatest kings that ruled Israel. He was the commanding chief of the Israeli armed forces of that time. So he was anointed king of Israel, and he did great for Israel. He fought many battles, and I want to believe that in the process, many people lost their lives, blood was shed, but he was a man who loved God. He was a, a musician. That's why we enjoy Psalms of David. So he did a lot, but finally, before he ended his reign, he decided to build a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem because the Ark of the Covenant was in the tent, and then he was not happy. He had a discussion with Prophet Nathan. He said, I am thinking of building a temple for the Lord in Jerusalem. Nathan said, it's a good idea. And then in the night, the Lord came to Nathan and sent him to David to say he was not going to build the temple, but his son Solomon was going to do that. Chapter 17 and verse 7, God reminded him of why he brought him. Verse 7, now therefore, thus says the Lord, you said to my servant David, that thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and I'll make for you a name like the name of great ones of the earth. Hallelujah. He reminded him where he got him, how he started, the shepherd boy, the one who was looking after sheep. I look at David and look at myself where the Lord has picked me. I'm Chiga from Kavale who moved to Hoima at the age of 16. As an immigrant, I was not bothered by being an immigrant. I remained focused on the Lord Jesus. And uh, uh, nine, when I was 19 years old, on 24th December 1974, I gave my life to the Lord and he held my hand. He has held my hand to this day, wherever I have been. So, someone who was no, unknown, the Lord brought me to where I am today. The Lord can pick you from grass to grace from dust and you sit with the princes and the kings. Hallelujah. So, I will never forget where I came from but by God's grace I am what I am. Yes, the Lord said to him, you will not build the temple but your son Solomon will. And he said, I got you from the field to look after the sheep to be the prince of my people Israel. And verse 8, and I have been with you wherever you have gone. Hallelujah. I have been with you wherever you have been. Look at your background, where you came from, where the Lord got you. The Lord has been with you. Uh, I told you about my time in Karamoja. The Lord has been with me. I was at a time when cattle wrestling was at the climax. There were guns all over. As the Bahima carried their sticks, the Karamojongs carried guns. Each young man had a gun. And you know, they are very good at target, even when you are army men, about 110 Karamajongs could terrorize the army men because they were shooting target. And the warriors would come, would see bullets flying over. Although I have not gone to Changkwan's political school, I knew how to take cover with my wife. Yes, when even military people will advise you, when you see bullets flying, don't peep in the window. A stray bullet will find you in your house. You only take cover. So we knew how to remove our mattresses and go down and sleep and we would see the new day. So that was life. And whenever I went home and told my people, they would say, why are you suffering? Why don't you come home? And I would say, the Lord needs me there. 
So I got another kind of world view in my own country as a missionary to understand that even in tough times, the Lord keeps you. So when God calls you, he equips you, he sustains you, he blesses you, and he anoints you. So the experience I got from Karamoja and the anointing has remained with me and I'm sure it will remain with me until God calls me home because it was a wonderful experience. And when I go to Karamoja, I'm going home. Um, 22nd, I'll be in Kotido and I'll be at home. Then I move to Moroto uh, visiting uh, those dioceses. I'm left with a few to finish. So the Lord has been with us as he was with David. He said, I have been with you wherever you have been. So, dear friends, it is us who desert the Lord's way, but the Lord is always with us to guide us, to bless us, and to use us for his own purpose. And he goes on to say, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Praise the Lord. All the enemies, the forces that were always confronting Israel, he always won the battles, King David and his army. So, I want to ask you, if you have never had an enemy, hands up. If you have never had someone who does not you wish you well, someone who does not wish you well, put up your hand. Oh, so you are like me. Let me tell you, there are always people who will always wish you differently. Even when you have promotion, they are not happy. Even when you are flourishing, they are not happy. Even when you graduate and get the second or third degree, there are people who will not be celebrating when you are happy. So those people will be always there. But I want to tell you, the Lord always removes our enemies before us. He always creates a way where there is no way. He always fights our battles and then when you get over that, you say, thank you Lord. Ebenezer, this far the Lord has led me. So cutting your enemies off from your way is God's idea. It's God's ability. You can't do it. There are people who struggle. There are people who revenge. I want to tell you, revenge is not yours. Vengeance is the Lord's. He says, pay evil with good. So, from my own experience, at my level of understanding, I have learned one thing which I want to share with you. When you have people who hate you, those who are against you, don't hate them. Don't shoot them. But pray for them. Pray for them. You know what happens when you pray for your enemy? You are released. You, have, you become a happy woman or a happy man and you, you sleep like a baby because the Lord will take care of that. And the person who harbors anger, if you didn't know, that person is killing himself or herself. Medically and psychologically, people get non-communicable diseases because they do not know. It is not infectious. It is you who is killing yourself. But what I want to praise God for, he removes all our enemies before, from before us. Yes, he creates a way where there is no way. For David, this was a great encouragement and that humbled him and he made a covenant with God. That is why verse 16, he went in. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, O Lord, and what is my house that you have brought us this far? Praise the Lord. He said, who am I, a great king of Israel, great man who had been led by God to do great wonders. But of course, he was a, a feeble, limited human being. He had his own shortcomings, but he always remembered to give glory to God. And I want to tell you, leaders and leaders in the making, always trust God. And as I look back, you know, when you are coming into leadership, you have a lot of apprehensions. You are not sure how it will go. You are not sure, but when you are finishing, you know where you have come from. Praise the Lord. You have seen the journey. Like, as I tell you, I know where the Lord has led me through. I don't, I don't want to say what I have done. It is the Lord, not me. It is the Lord. But, Ntagali, who am I? Who am I that the Lord has led me this far? With Mama Beatrice, who has sent you greetings. She's still very tired. She has had many things. But who am I and what is my house that the Lord has led me this far? It is by God's grace. It is by his love. He called me when I give my life to him. He has fought all the battles. Don't think that things have, have been easy even as an archbishop. But when things get tough, I look to the Lord, I say, it's all about you, God. Yes, whatever you are doing and you meet stumbling blocks, what the Swahili people call the pingamizi, you always depend upon God. Surrender them to the Lord and he'll 
lead you and you say, who am I that I have overcome all this? David was humbled. He said, who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought us this far? You know, we want to depend upon God's grace and God's love. Leadership is not easy, but the one who leads is the Lord himself. We depend upon his guidance and blessing. So in your position, even in your family, in your business, as a student, as a lecturer, depend upon God because he will always lead you to greater heights. Verse 17, he says, and this was a small thing in your eyes, O God. You have also spoken of my servant's house for a great while to come and have shown me future generations, O Lord God. Yes, what we look at as mountains, as impossible things, are small in God's sight. You know, a thousand, a thousand years before the Lord is like one year. So there is nothing impossible with God. Whatever we look at, the challenges we meet as individuals, as families, as a university, as a chapel, are simple things before the Lord. We only need to depend upon him. When you look for your own solutions, you fail. But when you depend upon the Lord and be guided by him, you know that he makes the impossible possible. The Lord makes the impossible possible. And the Bible says there is nothing that is impossible with God. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, I can do everything in him who strengthens me. Our Lord is our redeemer, he's our shepherd and friend, he's our rock and salvation. So this is what we need to do, to trust God, to surrender everything to him, even in leadership, in whatever you are doing, the Lord will make things easier for you. Even when you meet challenges, that's not the end of the world. There will always be challenges because we are still in a fallen world. But you will always know how to come out. Conflict and other things. You know, we all live in conflict. Each one. In your own life, you are at, in conflict at crossroads as an individual. With your family or your neighbors. But what is important is how you manage the conflict and how you get out the, of the conflict. Some people are swallowed by the conflict. They, they are shattered and crushed. But those who have good stamina... They depend upon the Lord, and the Lord makes things simple. And verse 20, David make the, made this declaration. David made this declaration after being convinced. And he said, there is none like you, O Lord, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. That was a great declaration. There is no one like you, O God. There is no one like God. Dear friends, it is so sad to say that some people in our world have made money their God. Some people have made the property they have their God. Some people think science and technology is their God. They have forgotten the God of our history. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, our God is the God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of our future. So there is no one like God. And there is nothing in your life that can take the place of God. That is why our country has the motto for God and my country. And sadly, some people have turned it to mean for God and my stomach. They are so self-centered. They want to acquire more, even through wrong means. So that is a problem. For God and my country. Our country has been endowed with natural resources, with good weather. Although last year we had too much rain and we had floods and landslides. We sympathize with those families that lost their dear ones. And men are still displaced. But there is no one like God. God is our great God. He's a great God to be relied upon. He has blessed Uganda. And he has blessed all of us. So there is no one like God. If you change and turn to other things to be your God. You are in the wrong place. God has blessed Uganda. God has blessed us. And he will continue to bless us. Yes, that was a great conviction for David. And verse 27 he says. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you. For it is you, O Lord, who have blessed and is blessed forever. It has pleased the Lord to bless our university. I've told you when we started, we are not sure what it would be like, but now we are one of the most reliable universities in this land and also on the continent. Praise the Lord. And our graduates, as you have heard, we don't need to be complacent. When our people go to the job market, they flourish. Even when they go to the law school, you know. 
Because God has blessed us. Hallelujah. God has blessed us. Now it has pleased the Lord to bless this university, this country. And the people of God are blessed. I want to tell you, you are blessed, my dear brother and my dear sister. Tell your neighbor that you are blessed. In Jesus' name, you are blessed. Uganda Christian University is blessed. This chapel is blessed. Your families are blessed. Our children are blessed. Uganda as a nation is blessed. The church of Uganda is blessed. And I, wa I want to tell you that blessing is not for a short time. It is forever. So we are blessed forever. You are blessed forever. Our choir is blessed forever. We are blessed forever. What we have to do is to claim that blessing. Are you ready to claim that blessing? Are you ready to claim it? It is yours. Nobody will take it over from you. What God has predestined for you is yours forever. Hallelujah. We are blessed forever. And that's a great joy. I love the words of Psalm 23. David said in Psalm 23, he begins that familiar psalm, which many people call Sunday school psalm, but it is very theologically rich and is very inspiring. He said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I love verse 5 when he said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Hallelujah. The Lord prepares a table for you because you are blessed. I have talked about enemies being removed from before you. The Lord prepares a table for you so that you dine with him. So that you continue enjoying his fellowship and his presence. That nothing will block you from reaching your God in prayer and fellowship. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. The cup of God's grace. How is your cup? Is it half empty? Is your cup of grace half, half empty? When your cup is full, you have the confidence to face tomorrow, to face all the challenges because you have a cup full of God's grace. Hallelujah. I am retiring when my cup is full of God's grace and love and mercy. Hallelujah. So the Lord prepares a cup before you, even in front of your enemies, those who do not wish you well, and he anoints your head with oil and your cup of applause. So I want to appeal to you, brothers and sisters, to have the cup of grace, God's grace for you, full, because God will always be with you. And he says, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise the Lord. Goodness and mercy follows those who love the Lord, who, who know that they have their cups of grace, full and overflowing. When God loves you, he loves you unconditionally. When he saves you, he saves you. You only need to keep closer to him in repentance and in fellowship with the saints. I shall dwell in his house forever. Remaining in the presence of the Lord, in his counsel, in his guidance, in his providence, forever. And when there is anything, you depend upon the Lord. This is what the Christian journey means. That you are not alone. You are not lonely. You are, even when you are in the desert, you are not alone. The Lord is with you. The Lord is there to guide you and to bless you. I love the words of Paul when he was saying farewell to the elders of Ephesus. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 20. He was moving to Jerusalem. He says in chapter 20 that I am compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem. He says I am not sure what will befall me including imprisonment. But he says, verse 24, but I do not count my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. That was Paul's commitment. So he was moving on. And you know, this was a man who was going to Damascus. He was Saul. He had an official document to persecute believers and take them to Rome to be imprisoned. On the way to Damascus, he met the light of God. It was too bright and he fell down. And when he heard the voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't know who was speaking. He said, who are you? And the voice said, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. And transformation took place. 
The man who was Saul became Paul. When you get that transformation from the Lord, you change your character, you change everything, and people will see you as a new creature. Because the Bible says, I have made you new. The past is gone. Those who are in Christ are new creatures. They get transformation and they are changed. So Paul became an evangelist. He calls himself the list of the apostles. We want to praise God for the life and ministry of our brother Paul. So I want to use the words he said to the elders at Ephesus and verse 32. He said, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Praise the Lord. I commend you to God. David said there is no one like God. And Paul in his farewell message he said, I commend you to God. I commend you to the love of God, to the grace of God, to the care of God. I commend you, my brothers and sisters, to God. We live in a very terrible time. The world is changing. It is becoming crazy. We are wondering what is going to happen. And uh, uh, people from the West who used to think that the dark continent, the former dark continent, has more problems. It is all over the world. It is all over the world. Whoever knew that the president of the most powerful nation in this world would be impeached, that means there are problems. You hear problems all over the world, but we have a wonderful God. We have a loving God. And we want to thank God for our brothers and sisters from the West who are our partners and our friends. We are members of one family, the family of faith, the family of God. So we need to trust God that wherever we are, there are problems, but we commend everything to God. We commend the people of God. Even those who are suffering, we pray that God will be merciful to them. Therefore, I commend you to God. I commend this university to God. Why I've been a chancellor for those years, fellowshipping with you, the vice chancellor, a dear brother in Christ, we have worked together. He consults, and you know, uh, when you are a chancellor, you are not the headmaster. He knows that I don't interfere because we have a university council. We have representatives, but when it is something that needs the intervention of the chancellor, then my brother consults me. Like appointing the the vice chancellor, that's the work of the chancellor. Presiding over the graduation, when I can't, I delegate. So we have had a harmonious relationship. We have had, because of Jesus, we have had a good working relationship. And I can't dictate. Even people who want to come to me, vice chancellor, you know, they want me to recommend them. I say, no, I can't do that because I, I'm only the chancellor. If I intervene and interfere, then I'll be spoiling my relationship with my university. So I commend you to God, the leadership of this university, all the DVCs, the academic deans, the heads of, of departments, the students, the guild government, I commend you to God. I commend you to God. All of you, my brothers and sisters, my sons and daughters, I commend you to God. There is no shortcut. You put God first and you'll not go wrong. And to the word of his grace, you know, God's grace. God's grace means that we don't deserve it. It's God's unmerited compassion, unmerited favor. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of, the glory of God. God reached out to save us. John 3.16, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. God reaching out to humanity to reconcile us back to our God and to our fellow men and women. God's grace that is not limited to people's philosophies and ideologies because those change, but God's word does not change. God's love does not change. Jesus Christ, his son, who came to represent God, does not change. And the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I commend you to the word of his grace that can build you up. We are in a Christian journey. We are on a journey to eternity. There are many things that will discourage us, but God's grace will build us up will give us the courage and the joy and the confidence to move on because we know who holds the future. And because the Lord Jesus lives, we can face tomorrow. So I pray that God will bless you. I come always as an alumnus of this university and to enjoy fellowship because I love you all in Jesus' name. May the Lord be with you. I want to invite you to stand up and we pray. The Lord has been speaking and he has touched your heart. 
We want to pray. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are tired of carrying your heavy loads, and I will give you rest. The Lord knows that you are tired. He knows how you came here to this chapel. The Lord Jesus is here, and he wants to give you rest. So respond to his invitation to come to Jesus, and you will not be the same again. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you. We praise you because of your love for us. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to your word. There is no one like you, God. Your love is ever unchanging. We thank you. We praise you. Your people have heard your voice. May you help them to understand your invitation of love, your kindness, your forgiveness, your love that led you to die on the cross. Forgive them, Lord. Change their lives, Lord. Help them to be transformed so that they can be sure of their citizenship of heaven. Thank you, Lord. We glorify your name and praise you through Christ our Lord. Let us remain standing. The choir, will you give us a chorus? If you want to come to Jesus, this is the moment. Come forward and we shall pray for you. This is the day that the Lord has given you to commit your life to him. Choir, are you ready? Yes, a chorus to bring people. Those who want to accept Jesus, this is your day. This is the time. Don't go back the way you came. In Jesus' name. You can begin to come if you like. You can begin to come now and the Lord will bless you. I pray for you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, you can come. God bless you. the Lord. This is a great day and a great harvest. A big hand clap to God. Let us give thanks to God for these who have come open land very courageously to follow Jesus. May the rest please sit. First this way. First this way. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome you to Jesus. 
Thank you for making a very brave and courageous decision to respond to the invitation from Jesus. You have come to the friend of sinners. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. And I want each one of you to put up your right hand. And I want you to say these words after me with courage and confidently. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for saving me. I have decided to come to you, Jesus. I repent of all my sins. Forgive me, Lord. I thank you for dying for me on the cross. I praise you because you are my savior and friend. I now surrender to you. I pray that you give me your Holy Spirit to make me strong as I follow you, Jesus, because you are the way, you are the truth and the life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for being my friend through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord God, I pray for these, your people, that you bless them as they have accepted you, that they will walk with you faithfully until the end of their Christian journey to be members of your everlasting kingdom. Bless them and use them for your glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Tokote. Amen.